Yeah, what I'm going to do. I'm going to make it really short. What's before mobile first? My introduction to Ken. <laughs> All right, so Ken's been working really hard on a book called Hammering uh, Responsive Web Design. It will be out uh, late this year, early next year ish. Check that out. Uh, really good uh, book that's coming your way. I know he's writing on a card, right? And uh, this is going to be a great talk. I think this is the talk to see at the 10 o'clock hour. You guys are the smart people, okay? Now take it away, Ken Tabor, Voice Before Mobile First. Thanks, Brian. Uh, thanks. Boy, big design. I've been waiting so long uh, for us to be here together. And this talk, What's Before Mobile First, really represents all the stuff that I've learned in the last year and that I'm so eager to share with all of you. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of people uh, might look at speakers and think, okay, well, they're just, they're just there to prove how smart they are. But for me, the only way I'm going to uh, show that I, my time was uh, well spent with you is if I can deliver value and I can make every one of you uh, smarter and come out of here uh, fingers twitching and brains uh, energized and pumped and you're ready to go build some genius. So with that, I'm going to basically uh, go through this uh, set of slides here. So the first thing I'm going to say is that if you're into taking notes, you can be more tactical, perhaps. Um, I do not. I'll do it. Thank you for the tip. So from here, uh, based on whatever notes you want to take, go ahead. But note, all this stuff is online right now. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm in the audience uh, in these talks just like y'all, and I was one of that too. Um, so capture this, and then so much of the slides, when you look at it back in the lab, they're going to be little breadcrumbs that help you connect the dots of uh, whatever you might have seen here. So from my perspective, I'm not really going to try to sell you on mobile first. I'm not going to talk native versus hybrid versus... Uh, uh, fluid or responsive or adaptive layouts. For me, my whole goal is to assume that you've already got concrete backing for mobile first, or at the very least, you're mobile curious. And then once people have uh, allowed you and let you uh, build a mobile specific site or web app, I'll tell you, you have a challenge ahead of yourself. You know, the, the challenge for me is what do you do before shipping your mobile site? Right, that's the heart of what's before mobile first. Um, you got to make sure that it's going to run on Safari and Chrome, the mobile editions. Uh, that's going to run on iOS, iOS and Android, uh, laptops probably, as well as tablets and phones, and then whatever BlackBerry, Microsoft, or Kia are doing. You know, some people they put zero thought into mobile first or mobile at all, and I fear for them. I mean, I think that their future is full of tears and sorrow. <laughs> and, and, and I started off with this talking about like surviving the insanity of mobile. Like, why is it crazy? And, and I'll tell you, you know, you gotta you gotta open up that suitcase of courage and dig deeply when you're diving into this stuff because there's so many form, mobile form factors, right? I mean, if you'll go positively mental trying to map this all out in your brain, and as much as I encourage brain sweat to find edge cases and discover happy paths. I'm skeptical about too much planning, right? You know, just trying to avoid the fear of making mistakes with all the planning. It's almost an anti-pattern after a while. At some point, we're building things, right? You gotta get it out of your brains and get it on the screen. And for building, we need tools. So in real life, it seems like the right tool for the job is easy. Uh, all these familiar tools, they, they have the right fit for purpose, and they're probably found at the local hardware shop. But choosing front-end tooling is difficult, isn't it? It's different. Sometimes you don't even know what the choices are. And so for me, building mobile sites is something you want to take out of the imagination, get it on the screen. And it feels like it's physical, right? You, you need to, to assemble it and bend it. And sometimes you need to hammer it into shape. So for me, you know, my goal here is offering up real-world tools for uh, that have helped me build mobile sites and mobile apps, uh, specifically web-based. 
And you know, my goal, like I said, is to provide value to all of you. I want to make sure that there's takeaways, that when you go out in the real world, you get back to the office and the lab, you are uh, better empowered. And so what are the seven tools? Hang on, there they are. We're done, let's go home. Uh, for me, these boost productivity. Uh, they, they help me find and fix glitches. They let me do polish more often. They reduce time and cost. They help planning. They help evaluating as you're moving along. And generally speaking, they make development life easier. Uh, and that, that's a key thing, right? Because it's kind of a miserable job sometimes. And so I said, what's before mobile first? Like mobile first, it's that one of these phrases, it seems like a catchphrase that came out in the industry years ago, and it's, it's not even worth talking about. And it's kind of not because like, there's no mobile internet, right? It's the internet, and everybody's walking around with these. And you think, well, can I just you know, kind of ignore that and just like build my desktop so it looks great on a laptop? Or can I, grab, like, can I just grab an open source framework and, and rub some cloud on it? and things are all good, isn't the hard part already done for us? Is viewing on mobile so different that we have to mindfully consider it and confirm that our stuff works? So of, course, so of course I say yes, right? Like, what's going on in this picture? This happened to me, that's my actual hand, this happened to me about three months ago when I was putting together this slide set, and like my brain exploded because it was perfect. Look at the top. Use the left and right arrow keys to navigate. Oh, it's so good! And then look at the title of it, Taking Control. <laughs> like, I couldn't be more out of control in this situation. And what happened? I had just bought a, a groovy new tablet, uh, a, a Google Nexus. Uh, I was so stoked, I was just kind of like walking around the house doing all my daily stuff. I was on the Twitter, and uh, I found a, a link to a presentation talking about machine.js, this really rad state machine that I love for workflows and, and for advanced UX. And, and so I clicked on the link and it went to this presentation and it's built in this groovy kind of like web app thingy. And then bam, I had no control whatsoever, right? And I'm pretty sure I checked that out. Like I, I couldn't tap on the arrows. I couldn't swipe. Like this person put this together on their laptop, delivered it to a crowd of enthusiastic folks just like you and, and then did it live on? No. So like people discover on mobile, right? It happens all the time. So let's try to arm ourselves with tools to think about it from the start and all the way through. And I say from the start, if you have something in production already, it's not too late. It's never too late, right? I'm an optimist. I still wouldn't show up to work today, the next day, because it's always so tough. So let's remember that before we ship our, our workout, you gotta check it on device. And if you don't have devices, there's ways around that as well. Like I came from the game world, and if it didn't work on device, it just didn't work, it didn't matter. And I, I think about that lesson when I'm building mobile stuff uh, today. All right, let's start with the first one, Google Analytics. You know, for me, what's before mobile first? You might as well answer the first question. Um, can you learn about your mobile users, specifically through their devices? Maybe they're not willing to answer questions for you. You know, they're busy. Um, you want to learn as much as you can about your users. And analytics help. And if you have a website in production now with analytics, you might find out our mobile users trying to hit it. And actually, I wrote that sentence in my notes about a month ago, and I don't like it anymore. It's kind of, let's go ahead and assume mobile people are going to hit your website. Let's not try to measure if 5% of your users are mobile and then invest in that. Let's think about it from the beginning. And if, and if you don't have uh, a site with uh, analytics on it, and I'm going to present Google Analytics, you're missing something great. So, so go back to the shop on Monday and start thinking about it. Uh, or tonight, sign up for Google Analytics. It's like so easy, it's free to begin with. Uh, begin with actually, you go into production well with it for free. It's five or six lines of JavaScript, you throw it in your index.html, bam, you're starting to get data. And data is interesting. You know, I mentioned I used to come from the video game world. Maybe a lot of you know me as a program writer for a respectable software company. That's only been the last three years. Before that, I was making video games. And about four and a half years ago, I fell into analytics because I was working for a small developer that contracted to a big publisher to make a Facebook game. And 
four and a half years ago, who was ruling the roost on Facebook games? It was Zynga, right? And like we, we said, oh, we're going to be successful. We'll do like Zynga. And one of the things they did is they did analytical heavily. They figured out and measured all the stuff their users and gamers were doing during the day and handed off spreadsheets to their MBAs, fresh grads, and said, okay, what do we do? And like, so like, for a programmer like me who's in invention, and my designer friends who are into creativity and my artist friends who want to just envision worlds, like it felt like the death of the game industry, right? That we were just going to be driven by all these numbers. How can you pinch a quarter out of a person by making them feel a little slow as their meter heart charges up? And what color hats are they going to build for their pigs and their farms? <laughs> Give away anything for free, but not pink, purple, or black. People pay money for that. So I did kind of rage quit the industry. Work life balance wasn't so good either. Um, but now I have a little bit of a different mindset about analytics. So I've come to embrace them because they help me discover what my customers and viewers and users are doing. And what they're doing, be careful about measuring what they do. Measure stuff that's actionable, right? Avoid vanity metrics that sounds like a pejorative term, kind of bad, because it is. Page counts are meaningless. They make you sound interesting in a meeting, they're kind of cool in a dinner date, but you know, ultimately you want to figure out what your users are doing, or not doing, or what to do, and help them. There's this interesting job, uh, business intelligence, I see people hiring on for. But, I, but I, I tell you, I warn you, and encourage you, don't let the khaki-wearing, blue-shirt, pointy hairs and biz dev be gatekeepers of these numbers. Go get them. Dig into them. Own it. And so speaking of owning it, all of these stats I'm going to present are from my personal blog. They're not from Saber Trip Kids. I'm not giving away corporate secrets here. But this is just something that's kind of useful and uh, measurable, and I can uh, provide to you uh, freely. And uh, it's interesting to talk about it. So check it out. Here's a way to uh, validate if you're on a if you're on a QA team. Maybe you're wondering what hardware do we buy to test on? You know, look at analytics and find out what are your top most popular devices that come to your site. Buy those. I mean, there's always limited budget, right? And you can't buy, buy every device in the world. Uh, in fact, there was a report that came out just a few weeks ago from a company, OpenSignal. They provided their Android fragmentation report. And they reported that their app was downloaded on 18,796 distinct Android devices. Like, that's mind-blowing. I don't even know how that's possible, right? Uh, it's probably combinations of manufacturers, screen sizes, Android, iOS version, uh, Android operating system versions. But still, it just goes to show how insane it is, right? It's crazy. If, if, you're, if you're in marketing and you're putting together an ad, maybe you grab the, the frame outline of these phones and slip your screenshots into that. And maybe you can connect with your audience a little bit better, make them feel a little more welcome. Like, these are actionable analytics. It's really key to also find out what version operating system is hitting your site. And so you can see I've divided it up, right? First half of last year, second half of last year, first half of this year. Like that's our key thing too, is find out your trends. See how your, your, your audience is moving and move with them. And this is important because as an engineer, you're probably always thinking, like, what's that cool new feature that you want to implement? You know, so there's CSS to help you do some of the kinetic scrolling or to get rid of that 300 millisecond touch tap delay. iOS 8 is about to release and they're going to have some killer new JavaScript features. So you want to keep a, an eye on when, when people are starting to adopt that stuff, and then you can reach out and improve their experience. <clears throat> of course, this pairs nicely with the last slide. It's on the Android side. What version OS is, is coming? And it's interesting to find out how people adopt, how, how your users, uh, how vigorously they adopt and update. This is an key thing, too. If you're a designer, you probably want to know what should I design to, what size screens are popular or out there. So artists in the room, you might look at this statistic and say, you know, how, how big do I design for? Or how, limit, how limited do I have to account for? What screen resolutions are viewing your site? This might look like a vanity metric. The countries that people are coming from, but I'd say that this is actionable, right? If you're a content strategist, and you're pulling together all your people in your company to write blogs and articles, and those people are writing slang or idiom or, or, or kind of, kind of uh, 
things that might not translate, so to speak, even to English speakers on the other side of the world, you know, maybe you back off on that. People in the United Kingdom, maybe you throw a U in the, with color around once in a while. Kind of show them some love, right? Perhaps you can try to appeal to their unique problems or, or, or drop in references to their cities. You know, show the love. They're your, they're your customers. They're your faithful, loyal users. Artists in the room. Some of these countries have horrible data plans. You know, do them a solid. Don't throw out high-resolution JPEGs all the time. Maybe shrink them down a bit and scale them up in your CSS. And then engineers. If you see an uptick in a region, maybe it's time to raise up new content delivery network edge servers to better serve that region. Extra speed is always better. This one is interesting to me. Bounce rate tries to measure the, the propensity for people to come into your site and then split, having looked at only one page, that target page that they link to. And so you want this number to be lower. You want the bounce rate to be lower. You want them to, you want, you want them to kind of come, hang out and spend on your site. And so this is one of those things you can do, you can measure as you're improving your site and making it more accessible. Is it working? Is the bounce rate going down? And it might speak to frustrations that your mobile users are having, but don't really tell you about it. And this is another interesting metric as well. Uh, I mentioned that this, these stats come from my blog, and it's probably, granted, people are on the laptop at their desk. It does have a responsive WordPress theme on it, so there's a fighting chance someone's flopped on our couch with a tablet. But you could kind of see, you could see from this Google Analytics stat what what type of uh, machines or categorically what type of people are coming at you. And again, I measured if I mentioned if you have a site in production, you can measure when it gets above a certain threshold and decide to throw a budget at it. But again, I actually think that's kind of bad advice. You should just plan for mobile first. But ultimately, it's about better enabling your customers to use your technology. And of course, this is a natural thing, right? You want to see trends, you want to see how the market's moving. I, I, provided, I provided, for my convenience in building the uh, slides, very coarse yearly stuff, six months. But really, in six months, things change so much. So, produce quarterly charts, weekly charts, whatever you want to do, whatever you want to go for. But, but, but try to always learn. And it's fun to learn after a while once you start seeing the numbers, especially when things are going in your favor from the investment of time and talent. So, so what if you don't have Google Analytics? Like, let, let me let me understand you better. Put, raise your hand if you're using Analytics right now. Oh, solid. That's like half the group. Okay. <clears throat> now, raise your hand if you're not using Analytics, but you're always curious. You've been curious about it. You think, you think, oh, what's this all about? What's the deal? Okay, cool. So, so those of you who are not using it, remember who just raised your hand and, and look for them later. You want to connect with them on LinkedIn. But. But if, if you're in a big company, like I'm in a pretty big company, I might be able to, if I don't have analytics, I might be able to team up with somebody who's an assistor organization who has a site similar to mine, or customer similar to mine. Go talk to their product owners or their engineers and say, hey, what's up? Let me, let me crack, it open, crack open and have a look at your, your dashboard. Are you in a services group? Maybe you've built something for another client who doesn't mind you taking a peek under the hood and try to inform your decisions about the next bit. If you're in an area, like here in DFW, that has a, a thriving crowd, a, a great community, USDA community, reach out to some of those folks when you see them at the next month's meetup. And if you don't have any friends, I believe in bribery. <laughs> I find there's an intersection that is always proven to work for me. This is science. This is no joke. <laughs> So I fear in America there's sort of this stratus, uh, striation, like artists and creative folks and then like number heads and engineers and science and and I and I and I hate that there's that whole like left brain right brain thing. I don't know if it's true. I think Chelsea will tell us that one today, busting brain in this. But like, don't be. Af I encourage you. Don't be afraid to embrace numbers. You know, you don't have to be an expert in the math behind this stuff. But go jump in and, and kind of. Wash the zeros and ones around you. 
and, and, and embrace this and see how it influences your, your thinking going forward. You know, everything we do is in the service of or it's informed by the user experience. And so given that, and then you look at this dashboard, this is a default dashboard, they're like, oh man, numbers and graphs, this is, this is, this is ridiculous. And I don't blame you, every time I look at this stuff with new people, it, it is a lot of detail. And then you can look at the, the left hand side and there's 20 more pages that look like that. And then you might be thinking, well Ken, those slides you did before, those look pretty concise and straightforward. Like I could deal with that, and this is gonna give me, it's gonna make me wanna barf. But, but, but it turns out it's cool. Google's thought about it. They, they know that they have that classic big, big data deal. Um, and you can build your own view of your own site's data. And so you build several views that help you solve several problems. So what's one problem? Like let's check out this, this. Like look at how lovely that is in rational. You know, total visits. That's an easy number to understand. In the middle, Android versions coming at you, iOS version, the mobile devices that are coming at you. The popular pages for mobile users, by title even, not even by crazy URL of your CRM database. And then over there, visits by country, device branding, the browsers that were used to view your site. So like when I look at this stuff, I don't even see numbers anymore, I hear voices which might make you think I'm crazy, but, but, but now I realize these are my users speaking to me. And I implore you to listen, right? Th these sorts of things point to your users' experiences, and that should better enable our UX. And so you might look at this dashboard and think, okay, well, Ken did this, like, I'll try to replicate that, right? It's like learning how to play guitar by Eddie Van Halen or John Petrucci, and they're like, Oh, you want to be a guitarist? Just do this, and then fingers are all flashing up and down. So I, I reached out to Google. Google's going to let me share this dashboard with everybody. And so this is pretty cool, right? I built that dashboard. I kind of slaved on it. I, I raised my game to, to deliver value for you all. Later, when you're looking at the slide share, you click on this link. It's going to log you into Google Analytics, and then it's going to ask you what project you want to apply this dashboard against. I'll never know. It's totally private. You know. I wish you well and good journeys, but th this will allow you to suck in that template from my site and apply it to your projects. So, yeah, and then edit it from there, see what happens. Turn big data into small knowledge. That, that's a definite message. And if you don't dig Google, I hear you, here's some alternatives. I've, I've used a couple of these, they're all great. And I gotta give a shout out to Kissmetrics. They have a killer blog. And they just put out like the best articles every day. And we'll even talk about their competitor, Google Analytics. So like those guys are on fire, I think that great attitude. Alright, so back to my seven ways of hammering your design into shape. Next item is uh, the iOS simulator. So I said I claimed that your design doesn't matter unless it's running on device. What if you don't have devices? Like, what if you left your iPhone at home? Or what if you're an Android user? But you, you want to be responsible, do the right thing, and confirm your site on an iOS device? Um, there's an iOS simulator, software based, right? And let's take advantage of this, because it's exceedingly handy. And designers and developers might want to work that in, you know, bring that into your workflow. And it's a good reality check. And so I'm going to run through these next slides kind of quickly. You can look at them, of course, later. But it's a freebie. You, oh, Windows friends, you're going to have a little bit of a problem with this. You have to edit the Xcode. Sorry. Uh, so, uh, so you're installing Xcode, and this is how you get to the simulator. Let me show you a demo. Uh, as I've become a public speaker and I've tried to learn how to do presentations, they always say, don't do live demos. <laughs> things could go wrong, and they list off all the things that could go wrong. I don't care. <laughs> it's like you're watching a cooking program and the chef doesn't bake anything. It's like, what? Get out a bowl and make something, dude. <laughs> so this is going to be the iOS simulator. 
Xcode. Xcode, open developers tools, there's a simulator. And so what does this do? This actually like tries to simulate pound for pound all the stuff that's going to happen. And then run Safari, right? And so Safari you can go hit your website that you've been building. Um, this in particular, it's simulating an, uh, an iPhone, so you can see that resolution. Some of the other options are, you know, getting into see how that very responsive stuff works. Um, that's one of the reasons why they say don't do demos. <laughs> Uh, you can do iPad format with different operating systems. So it kind of reset itself and you bring out your boot. So this is a great thing to have on hand to test your, to always confirm your stuff, right? You don't have to have the device. Um, you don't have to have the various operating systems. You can see it supports different operating systems. And so this is a great thing to confirm your work, right? And there's a, a little screen artifact to, to show you uh, to show you what I just did, just to kind of remind you when you get back. That's the that's the iOS simulator on the left, and then it runs Safari, and then over here you can see your website uh, get hit. And there is an emulator on the Android side. I'm not going to take the time to watch uh, to show it to you, but but you can definitely go look that up. Okay, so at this point, you might be thinking, who is this guy uh, in Tabor, right? So, um, let me this real quick. Uh, I apparently know stuff. How do I know stuff? I'm a product engineer at Sabre. So Sabre is a technology company serving the travel industry. Uh, there's like 10,000 people in 60 countries. It's a big company. It's headquartered over here in South Lake. Some of you might know it. See some of my teammates here. Uh, we, we try to uh, serve travelers, hoteliers, travel agencies, and corporations. And TripPage is an interesting app. It's pretty useful. We just got our four million user a couple weeks ago, which is awesome. It's great to build something people use. And, and it helps you when you travel. Maybe you'll try it next time. And it kind of gives you this view of your of your of your trip. You know, where do I gotta go? How do I get there? That kind of stuff. This app is interesting because it is a carefully curated stack of uh, open source technology. So you download it from the store, and it appears to be a native app because it's wrapped with something code called Cordova. So Cordova is an open source app uh, uh, tech that allows you to build an app from JavaScript, CSS, HTML. So like that's what we do all day long. And it's also kind of killer because we also have a mobile website that's the exact same code base. So our coders get smart and stay smart. And we're able to build stuff across all of our platforms. Um, some of you might be using it, some of you might check it out. I'm super stoked this year because I am talking with two of my uh, buddies, my teammates. And uh, you might uh, have a look at them. I sit shoulder to shoulder with them, they're, they're really bright, and, and their presentations are going to be killer. So you might uh, have a look at it. But I'm, I'm really stoked to be talking in general, but the fact that I'm here with some teammates is even better. Okay, so let's have a look at the next tool, Chrome Emulation. So again, what if you don't have the device on hand? And I say it's so important to, to, to uh, test your site on, on devices. The Chrome, Google's Chrome browser, they've thought about this as well. And it's far more than just a website reader. There's a whole slew of tools. Uh, this is a great one I want to make sure uh, I, I, I show to you. And again, you can run Chrome. Follow these sorts of steps, right? It's very easy to access it. And then you can go to one tab in the developer tool and pick a phone or a tablet or what have you. So let's have a quick, a quick demo of that. So again, I have a website. Uh, you might be seeing the dot local. Last year I spoke and I talked about how important it is to have the Apache web server running on your machine. So, so of course, this is in production. This is like a little passion project of mine. It's an iPad game. It's an action arcade nuclear reactor control simulator in the uh, comedy disaster genre. This <laughs> just hit the, the store a few weeks ago. But so I built this website, right? I'm like, oh man, it's better be really responsive, considering like that's my deal. So, so, um, 
So developer tools, and then you can go to um, that tab and say emulate and currently disabled. So let's toggle this. And so all of a sudden Chrome is going to help you. Oh, let me get reload this kind of thing. Let me get. And then so here it's going to try to uh, give you some ideas about what this might look like on these type of devices. And several of them are purely for the size of it, but, but check it out. It emulates mobile, so that means that it's actually doing the touch tap events. So when you're doing your jQuery handlers or your, your, your DOM handlers, JavaScript, you can do that. Like it, it'll actually try to spoof the user agent. So if you have a website where you go to the main website and it, and it does a user agent sniff, it tries to find a device and sends you to a mobile version of your app, like the M dot or the touch dot, which actually is an anti pattern and was successful years ago. I don't encourage going forward because what's the user agent of a wristwatch and the PlayStation 4 I have at home has a web browser? Like that's ridiculous, right? It's crazy. So, so, so you can still keep doing it, but uh, and it, it's a little bit weird. And then emulate geolocation, like this is really killer because one of the things we did on trip cases is implement uh, Uber, the car service. We implemented that when they did their API, and we had to test, like, how does this look when you're in Kansas? Or how does this look when you're in San Francisco? So here you can emulate the geolocation coordinates. And so when you're using the HTML5 uh, geolocation services, you can even have it broken. So you can test what happens when the user doesn't have it on or it's not responding because there's a straight cosmic ray in the cell phone tower next to them. So this stuff is just really powerful, right? And it's pretty simple. So so bring it into your work uh, your workflow. And here's a little artifact uh, showing you that. When you get back home, you can, you can say, oh yeah, aha, right, I remember that, let's check that out. And it's spelling words, I debuted that last year. Uh, my daughter has got a spelling test every Friday, and so I have her record the words, and you can do this in the car. Feel free to use it. Uh, ideally, your child will have the exact same spelling list as my daughter does every Friday. <laughs> <laughs> Try to coordinate that if you can. <laughs> oh! Chrome Canary. Okay, so did you know there's more than one Chrome out there? Okay, if you don't, let me show you this. This is rad. I call it a best kept secret. Like Google Chrome Canary. This is another version of Chrome. And I guess I would refer to it as like semi stable. <laughs> and so what they do is they allow you to preview what's coming down the road a couple months ahead of time. So, like, that's pretty rad as a developer or as a technical designer, is to make sure your stuff is going to work in the future. And then this is interesting because you can see how they're tinkering, right? They're tinkering. They're kind of figuring out what are they going to build. And so you can see that the device simulation, it looks different already. And then, of course, you can roll through all of the elements and kind of tweak the CSS and that kind of stuff. So like, this is kind of interesting. And this is... This is why I think Bernard is smart, my teammate right here, because he introduced me to Chrome. Can Eric? Yeah. Right. You see that the, the question was, and that's what you'll see live in the stable channel in a few months' time? Exactly. Oh, and here's a little artifact showing you that. Um, Safari so remote debug. So, what's a way you can debug a website on iOS? This is cool because it's actually going to touch a device. And I think that's important because it's a little more trustworthy than a simulator because it's the actual hardware. And you know, there's nothing like working code. Working code runs arguments. It definitely runs arguments. There's a little bit of setup on your iPhone or your iPad. Refer to this later. But basically, you're telling the OS, hey, I want to tinker with you. On your laptop, there's a little <laughs> tweak here. And I'm making a little bit of an assumption because I'm a Mac user on Windows. Please make sure this works and maybe do a Google search if you have to. I know Safari forces on that system and USB is a common standard. So once you get it going, you want to have a USB connection with your phone. And you run Safari on the phone, you browse a website. And then on your laptop, you run Safari and you connect to it. So my demo.
left Safari. I have a I have a website running over here. And then I'm going to Safari is running over here. And then here, check it out on the screen. Um, Safari desktop. Develop menu showed up because of that setup you did. Kenneth's phone knows my phone by name, and it knows that it has at least one page open. So check it out. Like, hopefully this is new to people. When I found this, I was like, oh my god, this is the best ever. Because do you ever get like hardware-specific bugs when you're writing your HTML and CSS? Yes, ma'am. So do I. So, so one of the things you. One of the things you see here is, is, is you have access to the entire HTML, all the DOM structure. Um, there is a debugger, so you can you can parse through your source code. I don't have a ton of source code on this, but you can set breakpoints. Actually, I'll tell you what. Um, when, when you test this later, make sure you go to the source code and set a breakpoint, because when you're operating here, it'll do breaks there. Let me show you that real quick, because that's kind of interesting. Uh, resources. Here's the JavaScript for the kind of spelling words. I'm going to set a breakpoint, and then I'm going to try spelling something. I'm going to try spelling it, and then I hit I hit a button that says confirm it, and then a breakpoint is triggered. So it's running over here. Ones and zeros are going down that cable, and on the desktop, it's saying, "Cool, I know what you're doing." So again, you can look over here. You can see all your variables. Um, you can single step it, right? Kind of inspect and, and see how the variables are getting triggered and, and tickled, and you can even tweak the, the, the resources. So uh, I think that's an interesting thing. Now I'm going to show you one more time. One more time. The iOS simulator. So you might be one step ahead of me here, and you're probably thinking, what happens if you try to run the simulator on your desktop and Safari on the desktop? Do the two talk to each other? He's are late, yes. OK, so uh, so I got my phone and the simulator. I'm going to select the simulator. And so now you can see that as you're uh, rolling up and down the, the, the page, you can do stuff. All right, so that's pretty cool. So let's do more of that. And then there's a couple of screenshot artifacts just to kind of remind you when you get back to the, uh, to the lab. <clears throat> you might be wondering, can I do the same thing on the Chrome Android world? How can I, how can I debug on device? You can. So I got a little Android tablet here, the same one I showed you earlier in the day. Again, this is called Chrome Remote Debug. That Chrome browser is far more than just a reader. It's a whole development environment, which is fantastic. Google's putting that out for free. I've paid hundreds of dollars throughout my career for tools like that. There's a little bit of setup on your tablet. There's a secret developer mode in Android. You go to the Settings app and you tap the build number seven times. OK, what? let's go, whatever. <laughs> it works, believe me. There's, a little, there's some other setup. Make sure you can do USB debugging. Let the OS know that you're going to poke at it. Connect it. Uh, run a website in the, in the browser. And then bring up Chrome. So let's see how this works. And um, there's this magic command about inspect. So check it out. So Chrome Desktop found my USB attached Chrome browser. So I'm going to hit select, and then you can see as I as I roll up and down the um, the DOM, you can see how it's flashing up this stuff, and then. Easily just kind of like tweak at the, the, the styling of the display. 
done. And then that, that top thing, that top element comes and goes. So that's great, right? I mean, it's super hands-on. Like I said before in the video game world, if your stuff doesn't work on device, we don't believe you, same thing holds. Working code wins, wins arguments all the time. Uh, there's a couple other cool things here. It's like, no wonder the Google engineers took free lunches. They're inventing this stuff all day. <laughs> so check this out. This is, uh, this is, this is called Screencast. So Screencast allows me to, in the browser, um, see exactly what's happening, right? So I'm scrolling this, and then it's scrolling that. And that's pretty awesome. What if you just had a, like my dream is to just have a rack of devices in the middle of a, a dev kit, and they just, uh, you just grab a USB drive uh, connection, pull it over, and you start debugging on your system. And again, you have complete access to the, the DOM, CSS, all that kind of stuff. Like that's totally rad. And it's just absolutely easy. And you can even interact over here if you want to. You could, you could do all your clicks and your scrolls here. Uh, screen, screencast. And I'm not going to show this, but if you have an app that's wrapped up in uh, Cordova, it's a web view, you can debug that app. So I could have launched an app on here that's uh, Cordova based, and you'd be able to do all the sorts of debugging that I just mentioned. And that's pretty awesome because if you have a production app and it's failing for somebody, you just load up the app that they have and the phone that they have. And then you can kind of see what might be going on. And there's a, just a brief amount of code that you write to make that happen. And that's native code. Let me, let me hit you later on that. I'll do Q&A later. Um, Ghost Lab. So Ghost Lab is an awesome tool. I call it automated manual testing because the deal these days is like there's so many devices, right? You really want to have a bank of devices sitting on a library shelf in your office, and you want to be able to hit all of them at once and see how your site's performing. But what if you want to interact with your site? So I found this tool recently, Ghost Lab, and we're bringing it into our uh, our, our production cycle. It allows you to find a website, and then when you do that device, uh, you, you do that setup. You're going to find that on device, it synchronizes these things. I'm going to show you a quick video of that. So I did this back in the lab one day. And you can see Ghost Lab is, is running on my, on my Mac. It runs on Windows, too. I have three devices. They're all on the same Wi-Fi. They're all on the same network. Wi-Fi. All of the devices, uh, Android tablet, iOS phone, iOS tablet, um, it'll launch desktop browsers. And then you, you go to the Ghost Lab server, and the Ghost Lab server will communicate with the other server and then send data back. And you can see how they're all coordinating with one another. Uh, and on the, on, the, on the right, you'll see Ghost Lab is reporting back information to you. Uh, you can see what devices are connected. And you can even inspect any of their DOM pages. If you see something going quirky, you can kind of hold everything. It's a little bit sketchy at times. I, I find that I just kind of hit reload or whatnot. But you can see that as I'm pushing buttons and navigating, it's going to synchronize it against all your devices. Like, just imagine that whole wall is covered with devices, and they're all doing the same thing. Uh, it just makes me tingle to think about it. Like, that is so rad, right? So, so this is a tool. It's actively in development. You have to go pay a little bit of money for it. But um, I think it's worth it. it it's got some amazing features to it. And there are some alternatives, nothing quite as powerful as it, I think, but maybe sometimes you just need to punch a paper <coughs> on the screen. The next thing I'm gonna mention, the last thing I'm gonna mention, I'm gonna mention it very briefly and let you sort of check it out later. But I think, I think it's important to be able to measure speed on your devices. How fast is your website, right? Like, is it, is it coming up? There's all these reports that are famously saying people drop off if your site's, if your site's slightly slow. Um, as you're adding good stuff, check it periodically. Get some insight, with PageSpeed Insight from Google, and it's gonna it's gonna 
it's going to be a website that brings up your web stuff. It's, it's a website that brings up your web page and tries to emulate it based on the setup of your target device and then let you know what's going on. There's another one, web page test, that again, you can have a look at it later. And it's cool because it's going to show you some of these waterfall effects about what your page looks like as it's pulling in each, each piece of J, JPEG, ping, CSS, JavaScript. And it's really insightful to see how long it takes to bring up which one of these things. Because there is definitely a cascading waterfall. So again, check this out uh, as you have time against your website. Okay, so I've reviewed all these tools with you. Um, you know, I think tools are so important. I think, uh, I'll just wrap it up here. I think tools are so important. Improving your tool chain, it's a must have. You know, when it comes to tools and choosing tools at the start of a project, it should just be a box you tick for the CTO to be happy. Um, in 1966, there's an American psychologist, you might have heard this in one way, and I want to look up a real, this guy, Abraham Maslow. I suppose if it's tempting, if the only tool you have is a hammer, to treat everything as if it was a nail. It's a cautionary tale for us, because we're brain workers, and we internalize our software tools so much more completely than other people do. You know, tools, they become an extension of us, but we become an extension of them, right? Because we're always thinking cracks and, and, and metal breaks, so it's easy to know when to replace. But you have to always do the same. You always have to think about it mindfully with software because it doesn't break, but it wears out, right? Just make sure you're always replacing these things. So occasionally, occasionally, occasionally reconsider your tools because new options appear frequently. And so uh, I hope everybody uh, enjoys the rest of the day. And uh, like I said, I'm here to provide value. And if I didn't explain something so great, look for me, and let's do a little one-on-one -on -one time, and ask me more questions. Say, Ken, what did you mean? And thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it.